A burnt-out car is found abandoned in South London. The police discover it's been stolen. Inside are partially burnt clothes and bed linen that appear to be soaked in blood. It's obvious a violent crime has taken place. And whoever did it, they're now trying to destroy the evidence. The police need to act fast. They need to find and secure that crucial forensic evidence that will help place the perpetrators behind bars. It's an uphill task. At this stage, they have no idea of the nature of the crime, where it took place, or even the identity of the victim. Catching a killer requires conclusive forensic evidence. From clues at the scene of the crime, to minute examination in the forensics lab, from the cold reality of the pathologist table, to DNA sampling, digital analysis. Each piece of killer evidence brings the murderer closer to justice. It's a wintry night in South London and the emergency services are called to the site of a vehicle which has been torched and abandoned. Response officers cordon off the area to preserve the evidence as the forensic specialists get to work. Senior investigating officer Will O'Reilly takes charge of the case. And that car was reported lost stolen. So it became of significant interest. The car is marked as the first piece of evidence, but it's what's inside that indicates a major crime may have occurred. If you're called to a, a burned out car that you believe may have any form of connection to a crime that you're investigating, uh, one of the first things you'll do is you, you'll sort of see what is left in the car, in the boots or inside that you might be able to use. So you want to retrieve that as early as possible. Unfortunately, one of the problems you often get is the fire brigade have got there before you, you have got water everywhere, which can cause you a lot of problems. But in saying that, sometimes you'll get things that are actually better preserved than you think. Inside the car was clearly evidence of bloodstained clothing, bloodstained bed linen, there was some face masks in there, there was some old carpet in there. I'm sorry, arouse suspicion. The forensic experts catalogue the bloodstained clothes and the face masks they find in the back of the car. On inquiries of the owner, um, it was quite clear that the property found in the car didn't belong in the car when they last saw the car. So they've been placed in there afterwards. Well, there's only one reason to burn out a car and leave it abandoned in waste ground, that's to destroy evidence. So when detectives arrive and see the car in flames and see inside this bloodied clothes and bed linen and a mask, they know that likely a very serious crime has taken place. Swabs are taken in the hope that DNA evidence can be recovered and potentially identify who was involved. The first thing that you'll need to do is to eliminate the person who legitimately owns the car, provided you're confident that they've had nothing to do with it, and perhaps their family or other people who drive the car, other people who are in it regularly, because there'll be a mighty mixture of both finger marks and DNA within that vehicle, because people don't clean their car every time they drive it. But once you've taken those people away from the equation, whatever is left, those are the people that potentially you're interested in investigating. Any DNA material emanating from perhaps the bloody clothing may take weeks and months to come back. So when the investigators are operating on the first 48 hours, they're not talking about trying to solve this case in two or three months. So they've got to act quickly. But at that time, they've got very little information to act upon. So they had no idea that at the end of their investigator trail, they might be talking about murder. Police urgently need to find the person whose bloodstained clothes were in the car. They search for any reports of people being treated in hospital for serious injuries overnight or people reported missing in the area. With missing persons, what happens is people normally ring into a police station. So you'll get a missing persons report. It'd be allocated to an individual officer. who will be a local officer, generally. And when I was a chief superintendent in certain boroughs and divisions, 
I would check the missing persons book at least once a week. So you see what had been recovered, what moved on, which have become investigations. Inquiries in local hospitals draw a blank, but police discover a local 41-year-old father of six called Roy Brooker had failed to return home two days earlier. Roy was reported as missing by his family. He should have turned up to the Nativity play where he remember his family. He didn't. They presumed he was just drinking with his old bucks in the inn and didn't come home. Brooker is known to police as operating on the fringes of South London's criminal underworld. Roy Brooker was a part-time petty villa, really, I suppose you might say, but part-time painter and decorator as well. Brooker's family say his disappearance is completely out of character. It immediately rings alarm bells with the detectives. Is Brooker mixed up in whatever crime has happened around the burnt-out car? They set out to find him. We did some inquiries and found the last time he was seen was drinking in a public house on the Old Kent Road. And we were able to discover the identity of the group he was drinking with. The group included a couple of known serious criminals called James and Jason Lawler. We knew that he was drinking with at least one of the Lawlers at the time, James Lawler. And they would known each other as families for years. The Lawlers were renowned for their criminal activity and, and they had a history of, of, uh, of crimes behind them. We knew that Lawler was involved in uh, contract killings. We know that he was a career criminal. James Lawler, in particular, was, was sort of a killer, and Jason had a proficiency, apparently, in disposing of bodies. They were all criminals, all drug abusers, users, uh, and in some cases, suppliers. Now, Roy was a kind of petty criminal. Uh, he uh, operated on the fringes of serious criminals. And the problem when you're dealing with uh, serious criminality and a serious criminal community, a crime family, is that around this whole community, people make money. Uh, they live off the proceeds and they benefit from uh, small jobs, petty jobs, cash on the side. But in return for this, the community is required to, to reward this crime family, often with no murder, a silence. So they likely uh, will not cooperate with the police. Police hit a wall of silence. They examine footage from the limited CCTV coverage of the area to see if they can spot Brooker. We did um, have a look at a CCTV trawl, but these are early days, this is 1999, and, and really the CCTV coverage that exists now, um, that you can really follow people around just didn't exist then, so nothing was achieved by, by looking at CCTV. It's now apparent they urgently need to speak to James Lawler. We knew he'd been drinking together. Looking at uh, Brooker's last movements, that clearly made uh, James Lawler a person of interest. James Lawler is nowhere to be found. But police obtain a warrant to search his flat. Coding entry on there, clearly that was a scene of a, of a crime. The carpet was cut up in irregular pieces, like there was a square missing out of it in the middle of the lounge. Uh, there was elements of broken furniture in there. There was tins of paint in there. Clearly some of the walls have been recently poorly redecorated. Um, there was a rush to leave there. It's clear there's been a serious fight in James Lawler's flat. Was Brooker attacked there? And where is he now? Despite the obvious cleanup operation, there's a wealth of potential evidence to be found and analysed. As a father of six, it was highly unusual for Roy Brooker not to return home, and the police are convinced he's come to some harm. He was last seen drinking with a violent criminal called James Lawler. The police believe it's likely they returned to Lawler's flat, where Brooker was attacked. Police have been called to a burnt-out stolen car in South London. In it, they find partially destroyed blood-stained clothing and face masks. They fear the items could be linked to the disappearance of father of six, Roy Brooker. The police have their first lead. Door-to-door -door inquiries have established that instead of attending his daughter's nativity play, Roy Brooker was out drinking with violent criminal James Lawler. Now the police have to analyse the evidence at Lawler's flat to prove that Brooker was there. The flat is designated a crime scene and a plan put in place to thoroughly search it. Those kind of scenes are going to be there for a long time. 
um, because there's there's a, there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of items, things that have been touched. You look for things that might have been moved. For example, an indentation in the carpet that is clearly there suggests that a table, the table is a few feet or even a few inches away. Um, you know that that table has been moved. It may have been knocked over. You look underneath the table and you find blood on it. But the person who's tried to tidy up so has lifted the table back up. Those, those sort of things. Blood stains remain on the carpet and forensic officers take samples to try and identify whose blood it is. It's their fourth piece of key evidence. It would be very difficult to clean a carpet to a point where there is no visible trace of blood. First of all, it's an absorbent surface, so it's going to collect blood pretty readily. It's going to soak it up. Then, once there is enough blood in the carpet, the blood starts to almost create a way through. It goes through the backing, and once that dam has burst, the material, the liquid, can then pull through to the floorboards and start to collect under the carpet. And in some crime scenes, we've seen evidence that even though you can see quite a heavy pool of blood in a particular area, if you tread on the carpet some distance away from it and make that contact, it can draw blood up through the carpet because underneath there is quite a, a, an extensive amount of blood that's collected. So blood and carpet has a really strange relationship. And in terms of cleaning it, the more you put pressure on it to try and remove it, the more you're actually forcing it through into the underlay and into the floorboards or whatever surface is underneath. So you really have an impossible task ahead of you to try and remove all traces of blood from carpet. Amid the chaos, the walls have been freshly painted and police suspect the reason is to conceal further evidence. Officers use a chemical called luminol to detect further blood stains. If a water-based paint has been used to try and conceal blood evidence, then luminol can still be applied to pull through the blood and give the reaction that we need to see. So it can be used in a very effective way to kind of screen large areas really quickly, actually, to see if there's any trace of blood evidence there and then we can start to focus in on those areas to do all the other tests that we do. The luminol shows up smears of blood all over the walls. It's clear someone, probably Brooker, has been seriously injured in the flat. Next, the officers discover what they think are bullet holes in the wall. There were certainly some bullet holes found on the walls which have been poorly filled and then painted over. The perpetrators at this stage would have thought that they were being forensically aware, but it's quite an immature response that even at that stage they thought that by simply painting up and cleaning this crime scene that it would immediately move investigators to other locations. In fact, what it did was drive uh, more investigators and crime scene analysts to this particular scene, and it told them a great deal about what happened and how it happened. It immediately told them this was not planned, this was disorganized, and this was not the way they intended uh, this particular event to escalate. With bullet holes and blood all over the living room, police are starting to fear that Roy Brooker has been seriously injured or even killed. As the search moves to the bathroom, another sinister discovery is made. There was blood staining found in the bath and including in the U bend of the bath, um, hair and bits of, um, of flesh. The team now suspect whoever was attacked in the flat was killed and then sawn to pieces in the bath. And there was blood patterning in there that the scientists confirmed was probably due to someone being dismembered in there. So in dismemberment, the majority of blood stains that we're going to see are going to be pooled blood or blood that's just been lost from those areas because of the dismemberment process, rather than blood that's been distributed actively around the sea, such as impact spatter, such as projected blood from damaged blood vessels and those kinds of things. If Roy Brooker has been dismembered in James Lawler's flat, 
it's very likely that his brother, Jason, the disposal expert, has helped him. Dismembering a body is not an easy task at all. It requires a degree of skill because you need to know which structures you're going through to be able to dismember someone. So very often when someone is dismembering another body, they'll often cut down to the bone and then use a saw just to go through the bones. It's actually that part which is the most difficult part. So if the person has sharp knives and cutting right down to the bone itself is not very difficult. It can be a bit like um, trying to bone a joint of meat at home. But when you get to the bones, it's the bones that are the difficult part. Now, if someone has a good knowledge of anatomy, they might decide to go through the joints rather than going through the shafts of the bone. But very often, people who do dismemberment don't have an in-depth knowledge of anatomy, and so what they'll often do is use a saw to then go through the bone. That can be anything from a hacksaw right through to a, a wood saw. Choosing the bathtub to dismember the body again suggests the involvement of Jason Lawler, someone who knew what he was doing. So in the bathtub, the body would be crumpled up, which would make it more difficult to straighten the body out to be able to do the cuts. And in fact, dismemberment in the bath is probably a slower process than dismembering someone laying out flat on the floor. But ultimately, it's the place which can be cleaned the easiest and it can contain all the fluids which can develop or, or come out of the body when the dismemberment process occurs. But if it was Jason Lawler who disposed of this body, his plan to get rid of the evidence was foiled by some defective plumbing. When you're dismembering in a bathtub, of course, the tissues and the blood will go down the drain and you will find fragments of DNA or fragments of tissue still within the drain itself. Now that's very important because it depends on how good quality the, the plumbing is. So usually in houses which have been in function for a while, you'll get some buildup within the drain, which will then latch onto fragments of tissue which are washed down the drain, which is the reason why they probably found the tissue down the U-bend within the bath. The samples of blood, hair and flesh found in the flat are sent off for analysis. Meanwhile, scientists have been analysing the swabs taken from the blood-stained items in the car. Police hope the fire hasn't destroyed this crucial evidence. If the fire is a ferocious fire and it gets everything back to ash, then blood-stained patterns can't persist in that. But if there's only a partial fire, or there's an area that's protected from the heat and the fire damage, so, for example, if there's been something laid on top of blood and it's that that's kind of protected it from the fire, then sometimes in some fire scenes we can start to take away the layers and unveil blood that's been protected and then start to apply our forensic analysis to that. So it's not a guarantee that fire will clear away the blood evidence. Fortunately for the police, whoever torched this car failed to destroy all the DNA samples. There was a mask, uh, at least one mask found in the car, I think there was a couple, but one of them was found to contain uh, blood marks on it. Blood DNA on that was found to be of um, Roy Brooker, as well as Jason Lorna. Police now have solid evidence that Roy Brooker has come to at least some harm. Finding Jason Lawler's DNA on the face mask makes it even more likely he dismembered Brooker's body in the flat. And he clearly wore that mask. Also in that, perhaps to disguise the smell of someone dismembering a body, it was smeared with a, a, a menthol sort of gel. Despite it being a burnt out car, the DNA results came out with some incredible lines of inquiry. Sadly, it showed that there was blood and DNA connecting uh, Roy Brooker to that burnt out car, which was obviously a, a foreboding sign. Immediately, the investigators thought it's highly unlikely we're going to find Roy Brooker alive. The next key piece of evidence was a mask, and on that they found DNA relating to Jason Lawler. And this was a, a, a man well known to the police. He was well known for assisting in the disposal of bodies and also assisting in the dismemberment of bodies. So the police suddenly were building up a picture of what might have happened to Roy Brooker. They decided that likely he was killed, perhaps in the flat, and his body was dismembered by Jason Lawler. 
when the results come back from the blood and flesh in the flat, the DNA is confirmed as that of Roy Brooker. The evidence is building, but there's still no body and no clear evidence of who's attacked him. Although we, we could prove an offence probably took place in that flat, and from the quantity of blood and whatever found in the car and in the flat, that Roy Brooker had been very seriously injured. However, that didn't prove that he died, and it's important for us to actually find the body. Police are frustrated. Weeks have passed and they need to question their main suspects and find out what happened to Roy Brooker. Then they get a surprise call from Sunderland. It turns out another man was drinking with the Lawlers and Brooker that day, Brian Stead. The informant tells police that Stead and Lawler fled to Sunderland after the attack but couldn't resist bragging about what they had done. I think Stead and uh, James Lawler were, were just like to boast, really, about what they did, how powerful they were, how they were the big men in, in South London. They boasted a great deal. And Stead made some omissions about the killing to his brother when he was in Sunderland. Those who, who might speak out, those who might uh, break the criminal omerta, who might talk of their crimes, might be trying to big themselves up, trying to suggest that they're actually bigger and more important criminals than they actually are. And that would suggest somebody who was kind of a mid-ranking criminal, somebody who's a, a little bit above the fray, not petty, but not a very serious major player. Naturally, somebody disclosing uh, about their criminal activities to close friends and family, you would feel reasonably secure. But the minute you disclose anything about your criminal activities to anyone, then there's always a risk of it coming back to you. It seems that all the perpetrators have long criminal histories and they've carried out much of their offending history together. So I'm sure there's a degree of camaraderie and trust and they probably have some confidence that they're all gonna be able to get away with it. But some weeks later, Stead's brother decides to inform the police about his boasts. I don't know why, why he, he came to tell us. The Stead family weren't in the same league of criminality as, as the Lawlers. Perhaps he weighed on his mind too heavily. So here you have Brian Stead's brother going to the police and disclosing that his brother has confessed, admitted, boasted about his involvement in Roy Brooker's death. Now for the police, the investigators, the picture is now emerging. And this isn't a confession from somebody who was distant. It's not some gossip they've heard. It's, it's not some circumstantial evidence. This is somebody from the brother of someone who's involved in apparently the murder of uh, Roy Brooker. And a little part of them would have said, hmm, is there some game playing here? Can we actually believe what he's saying? Is this too good to be true? But in this instance, the story uh, that uh, Brian Stead's brother was giving to the police matched the story and the picture. It was now all beginning to make sense. This was truly uh, a remarkable step forward in the investigation. Following the evidence given by Brian Stead's brother, both Stead and James Lawler are arrested. Jason Lawler was arrested soon afterwards, I think in the February of that year, because of the DNA linkage with, with, with the car. With all three men behind bars, the police must now focus on finding Roy Brooker's body. Despite the wealth of forensic evidence, the prosecution case could still fall apart without a body. Police are convinced that Roy Brooker has been brutally murdered but have no body. An abandoned car contained his partially burnt clothes and a face mask with his blood on it. A flat with Brooker's blood on the carpet and on the walls, alongside bullet holes and flesh in the bathtub, has led to the arrests of prime suspects Brian Stead and James and Jason Lawler. The detectives have built a solid case, but they know that murder convictions are notoriously hard to secure without a body. But their only chance of finding Roy Brooker's remains is if one of the suspects starts to speak. The three men are in prison on remand while police continue to try and gather evidence. Weeks pass without any of the three accused saying a word. But then Brian Stead has a change of heart. Brian Stead, knowing that, you know, we're 
we were getting some intelligence and also getting some forensic linkage across the scenes to the culprits. What really wanted to diminish his role in it, perhaps, and that's why he thought he would tell us his account first before the others and get his two penneth in and perhaps get some uh, uh, a lesser sentence. Stead tells officers that he, James Lawler and Roy Brooker, went to Lawler's flat to continue their alcohol and cocaine binge. The lethal chain of events starts with Brooker saying something derogatory about Lawler when he was out of the room. From the information that we received, we had the detail of what happened to Roy Brooker. So we had the detail because there were a number of people there. We had detail of what the argument was about, who it was about, the fact um, that one of them wasn't even there when the argument occurred. When he returned, having a drink, a bit of drugs, came in, was told, do you realize what Roy just said about you? And then it kind of kicked off. We already know that James Lawler has violent tendencies, and then you add cocaine and alcohol into this mix. So both of those substances are known to disinhibit people. So people that already have these aggressive tendencies, it can magnify them. It can also make them quite impulsive so they don't think through fully the consequences of their actions. So all of this together is a very dangerous cocktail. James Lawler pulls out one of his guns from a hole doll and shoots Brooker in the leg. Brooker then runs out of the room, followed by Stead, and they fight with knives. He said that they then ran into the kitchen and Brooker stabbed him, perhaps in mistake, thinking he was he was James Lawler in the fray, having been injured. Lawler then steps things up even further. James Lawler apparently then produced another firearm from the same holder and shot him twice in the in the mouth before shooting him again and stabbing him. Stead is adamant it was James Lawler who killed Roy Brooker and then called Jason for help. They called round his brother, who was, as I said, proficient in disposal of dead bodies. He came round with a toolkit where he um, cut up the deceased in the bath, um, using a saw, other, other implements, into disposable parts, basically. The group disposed of the body, including cutting bits of it up with a saw. So this just shows a complete lack of empathy, a lack of emotional response at the time, considering that this is that the victim is friends to some of these people. It really shows how they dehumanized the victim and saw him as an object, almost like an inconvenience that they had to get rid of so they wouldn't get into trouble. Stead's account of the dismembering of Roy Brooker's body fits with the forensic evidence in the flat and the car, but there's no way of confirming which of them killed Brooker. How correct that is, I don't know. It's correct as far as the disposal of the body is concerned. As for the, what happened inside the flat of the night, he may have been trying to uh, lighten his culpability. Brian Stead felt he wasn't guilty of murder. He played a minimal role. He may have been uh, and played some part in the disposal of the body, but uh, in terms of uh, criminal time and culpability, that was pretty minor compared to the uh, very serious crime uh, of murder. The police naturally were very suspicious. This is a man who was only talking under duress. Was this a self-serving confession? Well, yes, but was it also true? To Brian Stead's great benefit, his story and his confession appeared to match the evidence the investigators found uh, on the ground and also the picture they had been building up since day one of the investigation. So although his confession was self-serving, although he did the predictable thing and sang like a canary to try and save his own life, um, his story, by and large, did appear to uh, match uh, the evidence the investigators were finding on the ground. The evidence is beginning to build. Police have Roy Brooker's bloody clothing and bed linen. His blood and flesh have been found in James Lawler's flat. And a face mask discarded in the car has Jason's DNA and Brooker's blood on it. What they don't have is a body, the killer evidence that will convict the murderers. Finally, he reveals where they drove Brooker's remains in the early hours of that December morning. He indicated or he told us the body had been disposed of at an anthem site in Raynham in Essex. Stead even includes the gruesome details of what happened on the drive there. How they took the route, what happened, and the fact that the deceased's arm was placed out of the car in jest, really, indicating a hand signal left or right. 
Yeah, easy access to the refuse site uh, and literally just scatter these remains around that, showing no dignity towards him. Bearing in mind, they'd already shot him, stabbed him and dismembered him, but they took it even further by leaving him on the waste site. People used to talk about disposing of bodies uh, apocryphally in graveyards, but really you could find no better place to dispose of a body, a dismembered body, than in a landfill site. You have the odour, you have mountains of refuse, and there's no access to the public. And uh, for the experienced criminal, for an experienced offender, likely uh, they would have used a landfill site before or heard of someone else using it. So when it came to dispose of um, Roy Brooker's body parts, you would think, well, for an offender, it's a very good place. Basically, it was an old chalk pit, one of these massive areas where lorry after lorry after lorry, constant lorries used to come in there, tip their garbage in, into the front, as it were, which was then moved around by bulldozers, and once you get to about a, a, a metre thick, it was then covered with a layer of dredged soil from the Thames, and another layer was put on top, and another layer of another layer. So it was hundreds of feet deep, it's in places. It is now six months since the burnt-out stolen car and Roy Brooker's blood and DNA were found. The police now have an important decision to make. Do they press ahead with a difficult and expensive search to try and find Roy Brooker's body? Or do they hope for a conviction based on the forensic evidence they've gathered so far and a confession from someone who may turn out to be unreliable? The decision to search a landfill is a complex one. First of all, there are huge budgetary constraints in any police force. Um, secondly, uh, the force and the investigative team uh, and the prosecuting team might have felt it wasn't necessary. They had perhaps, in this case, sufficient evidence to likely secure a conviction. But maybe, in the absence of a body, it wasn't a guarantee. So to secure a conviction, a murder conviction without a body, is very, very difficult. It used to be rare, but now less so, because, of course, all the surrounding circumstantial forensic and digital evidence now can build a really strong map about how a murder was committed and who likely committed it. So it's much easier to secure a conviction now within the absence of a body than it was before, but still, it's a huge hurdle to overcome. And in the absence of circumstantial, forensic and other digital evidence, it's nearly impossible to secure a conviction. Despite the very real chance of failure, senior investigating officer Will O'Reilly decides to press ahead with the search. Once we had an indication where the site was, we had to come up with a, with a, with a plan on how to search it. He had breather tubes of methane, it had toxic gases in there. It was a health and safety nightmare, really. So we had to come up with a plan that would work to try and find the body parts of Roy Brooker. The site was designated a crime scene and the officers began the hazardous work. Not only was there a problem with breathing and apparatus and everything else, in that you had to make sure you didn't breathe in some of the fumes that were coming off that site, but your footing was really delicate to walk around. We had a specialist team of officers in. Um, I think they were with the inspector, probably about 12 officers working all day long, from sunup to sunset. The team spent more than a fortnight meticulously probing the rubble. Covering the, the, the face off of the dumping area, and then painstakingly, and, and with sometimes just with a, with a fork, literally searching through um, plastic bin liners, all sorts of stuff that had been mixed among the soil, etc. And of course there was a number of bones found. I mean, a lot of animal bones found there. Certainly, you know, the remnants of roast dinners probably. And, you know, for the, some, it's hard to tell which is human sometimes and which is just a, a leg of a, an animal. Um, so all sorts of stuff dumped in there. Very dangerous, very dirty. It was a horrendous task. It shows you, um, the dedication, uh, and it also shows you that the officers realise that it's important that they try and find and corroborate what they've been told. Towards the end of the third week, there's still no sign of any human remains, and the team is about to give up. 
and all of a sudden, uh, I can remember because I was there looking at it, the, the one of the machines had pulled away from the front of the mug. And literally a bone, almost by itself, stood on it at the front. And it, we all looked at each other and thought, that looks unusual anyway. This was the first sight of anything resembling human remains. If this was one of Roy Brooker's bones, then the evidence against the Lawler brothers and Stead would be compelling. A burnt out car containing Roy Brooker's bloody clothes and a face mask have been found in South London. A search of a hardened criminal's flat finds Brooker's blood on the floor and walls, likely caused by bullet wounds. His flesh is found in the bath, but there's still no body. Now the police are searching for his remains at a huge landfill site in Essex. After three weeks of arduous and dangerous digging, they finally spot something which resembles a human leg bone. The specialist search team makes a record of the find before sending the bone for analysis. Rushed it to a pathologist who was on standby and they confirmed it was a uh, human female which had been sawn off. For the untrained eye, looking at a bone can be difficult to know whether or not it's human. So very often I'll get asked to examine bones which the general public may have found. And in fact, when we examine them, they're often animal bones. So for example, an animal femur is usually much shorter than a human femur. It usually uh, is much wider, for example, in the shaft. So I can easily identify a human femur by looking at it. They're not yet sure it belongs to Brooker, but it's a pivotal discovery. That first bone we found was vital because we were about to give up, to be honest. We'd been there three weeks. It was a very expensive exercise. It was a very dangerous exercise. And we were clearly affecting how the site was being run as well for its normal activity. Um, there was a large police encampment on there and there was other demands coming in on, on policing. However, for us, an SIO involved in the case, not only for, for um, putting that case completely together to find evidence of the, of the deceased remains, but it was vital closure from family as well. I mean, because up till then, that was an account given by Saint. We didn't know if it was right or wrong. The team continues to search for human remains, which might be identified as Roy Brooker's. When we first started to, to, to look at searching this, this uh, site, it was about six months since uh, we knew Roy Brooker had died. And we were told by experts of the field that we would probably find uh, fairly um, intact body parts. But after a couple more days, they call off the search after finding just three more bones. But the ones we found had no flesh on them at all. They literally with the heat of the soil and, and, and disposal in there. They had just been defleshed and, and, and it was just literally bare bones. As more rubbish comes onto the landfill, then there will be further raking and distributing of the rubbish itself. So that will cause parts of bodies to be distributed over quite large areas. Then on top of that, you've got the fermentation which occurs. So normal bacterial fermentation of rubbish will generate heat and that will speed up the decomposition process. So soft tissues of the body will actually decompose much quicker in landfill than they would do, say, if being buried in the woods. That does cause a real problem for police and that will be the reason why they've only been able to find fragments rather than the entire body. Those bones were secured, were uh, forensically examined at the scene, properly bagged and isolated, and then sent off for analysis. The DNA recovered from the bones is compared with the samples of Roy Brooker's DNA supplied by his family. Body parts that you can compare it with. Uh, a toothbrush is a good example. If you've got someone's toothbrush, you can get the DNA from that. So that will be the controlled sample. And we know that that's um, Roy Brooker's. And then when you find items that you think are his, then compare that to see if they're a match. And that's what happened. The detectives finally get the results they're hoping for. The tests confirm that all four bones are those of Roy Brooker. And those were um, eventually the returns of the family and they held a, a ceremony, a religious ceremony. The finding of the body parts was not only crucial for the investigation, it was crucial for the family. At last they had something to bury. They had some body parts they could put in the coffin 
and they could send them out and they could really deal with their grief finally. Police now believe that not only is there a wealth of forensic evidence against Dead and the Lawler brothers, they finally have the killer evidence. Brooker's bones from the rubbish tip, proving he was murdered shortly after he disappeared on the 16th of December, 1999, in Bermondsey, South London. On the 27th of November, 2000, the trial begins. Despite helping police, Brian Stead is still charged with the murder of Roy Brooker, along with James Lawler and Jason Lawler. They all plead not guilty. It's an ordeal for Roy Brooker's grieving family. They had to sit through a three-week trial where the gruesome details of their loved one's death was writ large and spoken of in very graphic terms um, in front of the press, in front of the jury and in front of, of the entire courtroom. Inevitably, the defence will get to work and attempt uh, to deflect and disassociate uh, their clients from the crime. In James's case, he claimed to have an alibi from his sister for the time uh, of the murder, um, and that, in, in the end, didn't work. Uh, Jason Lawler uh, didn't give any evidence at all, as is his right. It's the prosecution's job to convict him, but it's not his job to prove his innocence. His guilt has to be proved by the prosecution. So um, Brian Stead turned state's evidence. He was now the insider, so he was the secret weapon. He was the man who was party to this, and he was able to isolate and name and tell of everybody's role in this gruesome crime. He, of course, maybe predictably, and this left him open to some criticism in the dock, um, uh, minimised his role in the murder. He claimed he acted under duress to dispose of the body. They actually turn on each other during the trial, which shows that that it's all quite superficial to a degree. They will do or say whatever they need to to try and save their own skin when it really boils down to it. On the 18th of December 2000, a year and two days after Roy Brooker's disappearance, all three men are convicted. Brian Stead's strategy to inform on the Lawlers and avoid a murder conviction fails. James Lawler and Brian Stead um, were sentenced to the same period of imprisonment, life imprisonment together. The judge said they were sort of co-conspirators as this was a, a joint enterprise with the two of them um, and that uh, Jason Lawler uh, was involved in the conspiracy to promote the cause of justice, i.e. the disposal of the body, and he received a term in prison of eight years. I looked at them as they were being sentenced and I saw in no remorse in their eyes. A lot of murder investigations lead to the success of a charge and conviction because of mistakes made by the individuals who perpetrated them. They were well practiced in the art of murder and in the underworld dark arts of body disposal. But in this instance, uh, they left uh, a disorganized crime scene. But of course, the crucial thing was they left behind a witness, Brian Stead, who turned state evidence, and that led the police to the killer evidence, the evidence which ultimately secured their conviction, and that is the body parts in the landfill site. We've had the key witness coming forward and give us that information of where Roy Brooker was uh, deposited and left on a rubbish site. We wouldn't have found the, the bones, we wouldn't have tied that back in. It's quite likely that um, the perpetrators would have gone on free and gone on to kill others. 18 months after the trial, Brian Stead and Jason Lawler try and appeal their convictions. Stead again accepted he helped get rid of the body, but denied any part in the murder. Jason Lawler denied any part in the proceedings. What's interesting about the ruling against Jason Lawler's appeal is the evidence that the judge talked about, which was found originally in the burnt-out car. And the judgment stated that the jury were entitled to infer that someone had used a face mask while cutting or assisting in the disposal of Brooker's body. And also that the wearer of that mask at the time was Jason Lawler. The judge concluded that the facts as they stand at the moment exclude all other reasonable inference other than that it was Jason Lawler who was wearing the mask when the body of the deceased man was being dismembered. So it seems at least that for Jason Lawler, the discovery of just one face mask might have been enough to convict him. But 
We'll never know who's in front of a jury. So the investigators did the right thing. They compiled a mountain of evidence uh, to secure a conviction. But it may have been the case that the face mask was just all they needed. Brian Stead's appeal was also thrown out. His life sentence remains in place and he and James Lawler remain behind bars. Roy Brooker was a much-loved family man, a father of six, who was meant to be attending his daughter's nativity play. His association with violent criminals in South London was his undoing. For their part, the Lawler brothers got sloppy. An unplanned killing left behind a crucial trail of evidence which eventually placed them behind bars.